I could see the little legs on it, like little pods on the bottom. It was a saucer-shaped deal. When it got over the village, and it was gone out of sight. It was a, a disc-shaped craft that came very close to us, flying very, very quickly. It appeared to be of a pyramid or tetrahedral shape, and it was observed by thousands of witnesses. I seen it. I know what I seen. I'm a believer in it. I am Willem Heister. I made this recording. I'm the owner of the camera. I'm a lieutenant colonel in the Dutch Army, also a military psychologist. Unidentified flying objects are usually dismissed as fantasy, but sightings are often reported by highly credible witnesses. They have even been seen by two British policemen. Patrol car Delta 9 with PC Roger Willey and PC Clifford Waycott, based at Oakhampton, were out on night duty patrolling the A3072 Hatherley to Holsworthy Road. Precisely one minute past four o'clock this morning, they sighted an object 400 yards away from them and at treetop level. They reported immediately to Oakhampton Police Station where further men were brought out. There was no question whatsoever that um, this was a pigment in the imagination. It was, it was definitely there. It was definitely either manned uh, by some sort of being or remotely controlled. It was definitely being controlled to view our car or... You or had the, the feeling facility. it was watching you? Definitely, yeah. yes. Pilots, astronauts, even the first round-the-world yachtsman, Francis Chichester, have reported seeing things which seem to defy rational explanation. It was a perfect shape. It was, it was shaped with sort of, well, like a pearl with a, with a tail. Uh, you know, just a blimp, a pure blimp sorry, um, shape. And I watched this thing and, and, and suddenly it disappeared. And I was, I, I thought, well, am I? Um, seeing things. Reports of sightings can always be questioned, but film of UFOs is harder to refute. These images were taken over Utah in 1952. The film was minutely scrutinized by the US Navy's Photographic Interpretation Lab. They concluded that the objects weren't birds or balloons, but self-luminous, unidentified flying objects. But in spite of such evidence, scientists have always been skeptical. Sir Richard, what do you think of this flying saucer business? Well, it's impossible to say what people actually see it as you're there at the time, and you do get uh, all sorts of reports. If you one didn't see it oneself, one can't say what it is they actually saw. You've never seen anything yourself? No, never. Between 1948 and 1969, the US Air Force investigated 12,618 reported sightings. Over 11,000 were identified as material objects, weather conditions, or hoaxes. But 700 cases remained unexplained. As the number of sightings grew, UFO groups sprang up all over the world. For Charles Bowen, editor of Flying Saucer Review, the debate wasn't so much about whether UFOs were real, but where they were coming from. You don't think it's possible that they could come from another planet within our solar system? It is possible, but uh, things seem to prove a uh, point otherwise. This means they've come a very long way. Indeed. You think this is still quite possible? This is several light years, <laughs> isn't it, from the nearest? Well, we must, we must get round to the way of uh, thinking in terms of non-man-made machines, something more sophisticated than we have ever produced. 
This film was shot in the United States in 1965. The image became world famous overnight, but was it genuine or a hoax? Like so much of the visual evidence, it's hard to prove one way or the other. Strange. Most people like yourself who have come to believe in flying saucers seem to be, in a sense, uncritical in that they say, right, we accept all the sighting reports we've seen, we accept the films we've been shown, but they haven't, on the whole, got their own first-hand experiences. Have you? Uh, have I actually seen one? Hmm. Um, yes, I have seen one. I saw one in 1963 uh, in London from my flat. One that satisfied you beyond all reasonable doubt? Yes, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to my, the best of my knowledge, it was nothing that could be rational, uh, rationally explained as being from this earth. South America seems to be the most active area for flying saucers. Ufologists believe the spacemen may even have bases there in the Mato Grosso and the Andes and even underwater along the Atlantic coast of Patagonia. In France, an investigator discovered that reported sightings for one September night in 1963 fell in an absolutely straight line from Bayonne to Vichy. Ufologists have since used that method to work out two lines of orbit which, they reckon, link the areas of maximum flying saucer activity. Gordon Cracky from the British Foreign Office had his own theories. I think that there is more than one type visiting us. I think there are at least five. I'm talking of types of beings, not types of craft. There are about 30 types of craft. Uh, I think a minimum of five types of beings are coming, and possibly eight. And I think that some of them may be friendly and some may not be. There have been many actual shapes. The cigar shape, which are usually the parent craft. Um, there have been disc shape, many disc shape. Uh, tadpole, um, heel, like that in a man's shoe, bubble, uh, triangular, uh, and so on. The most disturbing theory of all is that the men in the flying saucers are our own descendants, perhaps centuries in the future, who found a way of breaking through the time barrier to visit their own past, which is our present. It is um, part of modern astronomy, isn't it? It's accepted by modern astronomers that it's possible that there are many planets in our galaxy that could sustain our kind of life, or life similar to ours. Uh, oh yes, in our galaxy, but not in the solar system. This makes an enormous difference about the travel time. The, uh, if the thing is uh, many thousand light years away from here, or many million light years away from here, uh, you, even if you move with the speed of light, you've got to be many million years old to get here. Friendly or not, in the United States, the military faced growing criticism from the public and the media for not taking the subject seriously. In 1966, the US Air Force tried to silence its critics by asking the University of Colorado to conduct the most exhaustive scientific study of the UFOs ever undertaken. Their aim was to put an end to speculation and clear the air of flying saucers once and for all. Author and UFO expert Timothy Good has closely studied the Air Force report. If you actually read the scientific study, which is a very, very long book, um, it's quite clear that a relatively large percentage of the cases investigated by specialists, by scientists, in specific disciplines, were unexplainable. I think something like 30% of the 117 cases examined by the Colorado University commissioned, Commission were unexplainable. The report satisfied the military establishment, but it didn't stop the sightings. UFOs continue to be seen around the world, no more so than over the small English town of Warminster. During the 60s, it became the UFO capital of the world.
a lot of people reported these strange clatterings on roofs, which, uh, as I say, is often the onset of poltergeist activity. In, in other situations, it would be looked at in that way. And there were many sightings of um, people down on outside the towns. People would be sort of walking in the, in the fields, and they'd see someone who would just fade away or disappear, very ghost-like. A worried town came together at a public meeting. First, me, let me thank you all for coming along this evening, and I hope that what will prove a constructive meeting. It is perhaps appropriate if I first give some background information to clarify the aims of this meeting. I called the meeting because some people said they'd seen things and in the local paper they'd written a letter and then some other individuals ridiculed these good people saying they ought to take more water with the whiskey. Many of our townspeople have been frightened by unusual sounds. If tonight we can contribute something constructive to the explanation of these phenomena, it might be able to assure these people who have nothing to be alarmed about. The meeting was riotous. You couldn't get into the town hall. The main street was festooned with people. Personally, I had to have a police escort to get in. One night back in the summer, it could have been the 11th of August, I heard a sound that was really horrible, but I would have said was a common old garden helicopter sitting only a few feet up above the houses in the town. At quarter to four in the morning, I was wakened by this dreadful droning sound. Would you like to speak up? And um, I went to the bedroom window and I saw this brilliant object. It was quite low in the sky. And I live up Beacon View that way. And it seemed to be travelling very slowly. And I was petrified. I just couldn't move. I was shaking like a leaf. I just couldn't move. And I, it was going on for half an hour. How many people here tonight are afraid of the thing? How many of you? Was this the thing? It was photographed over Warminster by a local boy, Gordon Faulkner. From what he told me at the time, he was coming out from his house uh, to take his camera, which was a rather nice one, a Japanese one um, at that time, um, much better than the one my daughter had. And uh, he was bringing it down to uh, loan it to her. And he was just coming out of his garden door and, and he looked up and saw this thing across the skyline above the houses. And he thought, that's something odd. And he had to have his camera, so he just snapped it. Um, didn't really think any more about it, thought, well, it was odd. But when it was developed, of course, that was the, the photograph that uh, was sort of accepted all the way around. The events that so terrified the inhabitants of Warminster sparked the imagination of John Spencer, then only 11 years old. Now vice president of the British UFO Research Association, he is still intrigued by the Warminster sightings. In terms of flying saucers pictures, it's about as good as they come, which is, which is to say pretty bad. Um, there's a general rule in flying saucers that the most clear pictures, usually eventually, you can find the strings that hold them up. The real ones do tend to be sort of pretty grainy, pretty blurred. Because by their nature, these things are reported as moving at high speed and often soundlessly and often surprisingly. So, you know, Gordon's account is pretty well a standard one and the picture is not... Uh, not surprisingly, very blurred. I have to say, it's a, it's a very limited picture because there's nothing else in the picture at all to give it perspective or size or distance. There's, you know, every, almost every dimension of the thing is, um, uh, is a guess. Armed to the teeth with sophisticated devices, the world's UFO enthusiasts flocked to Warminster. Every night, sky watchers crowded onto the hills, determined to catch a glimpse of an extraterrestrial. A local farmer, Molly Carey, got caught up in UFO mania. She took pity on frozen sky watchers, and her home often became an unofficial guest house. Some nights, she'd have up to 20 people sleeping on her floor.
people used to come from all over, and it has been said with there could have been one or two aliens came, but that was just what they used to say. But they came from, all, and they were all ages, from the very young to the very old, um, all walks of life. I remember the UFO flap down in Warminster back in late 1964 I think it started and it went on in through 1965 through 1967. At the height of it I went down there and I can remember traipsing around very cold hilltops together with teams of uh, other enthusiasts. I never saw anything other than satellites and aircraft I have to say even though others disagreed with me. What was always interesting with the sky watches is that we had, you could, you could see the sociology of UFOs as well as the, what was in the sky. You could see different people and you could stand in a group of people and in six people, three of them could see lights in the sky, two of them could see nothing whatsoever and another person could see portholes on a spaceship from Venus. And that was always fascinating that different people could interpret things so obviously genuinely and passionately, but it, it, it taught, I think, all UFO researchers a lot about we have to study people as much as we have to study photographs. 30 years after the famous photo of the thing appeared, John Spencer had a call from a friend of Gordon Faulkner claiming the photo was a fake. Gordon Faulkner and I did some experiments with uh, little models made out of little bold tops and buttons and it's a cotton or exactly, I can't remember exactly exactly what they were made of, but they're all, they all small. Um, they were tried, trying them in the air, taking a photograph, trying to get a rough idea as to how small it could get. The film being developed by somebody local. According to Roger, Gordon and he and others involved, indeed in, he thought people working fr here in the Warminster Journal at the time, got together to play a practical joke on the then owner, Charlie Mills. Roger makes the point that considering the fuss that had been going on in Warminster, he believes that Charlie Mills knew this was a joke because here it is, it's a tiny little paragraph here and it's right next to um, Mrs May Butterworth advertising for someone to take over the job of counting wild fowl on sheer water in the winter months. In other words, there's been no fuss made about it considering the apparent value of this and considering the extraordinary spread that came in the Daily Mirror when Arthur Shuttleworth took it to the Daily Mirror within the next day or so. Gordon has always said that it was a genuine photograph and I've never sort of disbelieved him because he's, um, he's a very keen photographer, does a great deal of photography, but I have never doubted him for one moment that he took a genuine photograph of something that was very odd at the time. If I, or if anyone, can prove that Gordon Faulkner is telling the truth or lying or that Roger is telling the truth or lying, it won't make any difference to the impact this photograph had. Whether it was milk bottle tops and, and, and buttons or whether it was a genuine UFO, the picture centred attention on Warminster. Over the years, the case for flying saucers has been dogged by hoaxes. This craft was seen by hundreds of witnesses who were convinced it was real. In reality, it was just an elaborate April Fool's Day joke to publicise an airline. However, it showed just how easy it is to fool people into believing they have had a close encounter. Photos and fleeting sightings can easily be explained away, but in the 1980s, the story took on a new dimension. Strange crop circles began to appear in Wiltshire, England, just a few miles from Warminster, 
the center of UFO activity 20 years earlier. Even some die-hard skeptics were puzzled. Ufologists looked towards the heavens for an extraterrestrial solution. They hoped to see circles being formed and catch a glimpse of what or who was creating them. Seriologist Colin Andrews has been investigating crop circles for more than a decade. We are looking at extraterrestrial uh, or indeed simply a level of nature, high nature, we don't understand. Once again, sky watchers began flocking to the hills. I believe that the, the UFO phenomena and the crop circles are totally connected, and it's to uh, reawaken an ancient knowledge that we've forgotten. Colin Andrews has been collecting and processing crop circle statistics in an attempt to solve the riddle. This is indeed a mystery. I've dealt with, worked with at least 50 scientists and engineers on this over the last nearly 10 years, and there's nobody in the world that's anywhere near an answer to account for this. I believe we're looking at some form of intelligence. In September 1991, Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley owned up to creating at least some of these mysterious patterns. We wanted to make the UFO Society think that a UFO had landed, you see. And um, after a few years, they, they didn't know whether to believe it or not. And um, as the years rolled by, we started doing certain patterns. And as you see today, we got quite complicated in them. At certain times of your life, you love to take somebody for a ride, don't you? If it's not doing any harm. And I didn't see it doing any harm. A relationship was originally perceived between UFOs and crop circles. It was thought that the, uh, the crop circles were UFO landing sites. Only at the very beginning, when the first sighting was, was uh, of a crop circle was found, it was circular, and it was UFO researchers that investigated it. If we believe the claims of Doug and Dave, who say that they actually manufactured crop circles, the first elaborate pattern that they went for was a sort of si a, a one major circle in the middle and four outriders at the edge. And they said that they deliberately created that in the shape of the lunar module to make it look like something had landed. The experts weren't so easily fooled. It, it's an obvious, I mean, it's yeah. absolutely obvious. This it's, here, you um, see, it's not consistent at all with the genuine phenomenon. To this day, the crop circle controversy continues. An amateur cameraman captured on film this shiny object flying up from the corn. Could this be an extraterrestrial explanation for the crop circles? Where it go? No way is that piece of paper. It's a bird. What? A shiny bird? Where's it gone? Just there above that tractor. Oh. Stop. The farmer too reported seeing a silver disc flying overhead. In the late 1980s, the ufologists' attention switched to Florida and the town of Gulf Breeze. Over the dunes. Oh my God. There she is. There she is, right there. Oh my God. In 1987, okay. this small coastal town in America oh, yeah. was overtaken by UFO fever. Like Warminster, high. the UFO sighting put Gulf Breeze firmly on the map. Watching it here. Kind of solid in the sky right there. That's the... Uh, 
tower way back beyond. Local property developer Ed Walters took this video in 1993 while walking along the Pensacola shoreline. Oh my God, just hovering right there. Bob Urschler, an aerospace technologist, was intrigued by the stories coming out of Gulf Breeze and went to look for himself. It was at night the first time Ed and I were driving in his truck just across the bridge here to Pensacola. And as I'm sitting in the passenger seat looking across at Ed, I noticed just out through the window this extraordinary object, really, that was just above the water. You could even see the glow of the light on the bottom of the craft reflecting off of the water surface, which was kind of ripply. And it, it was such a shock, really, to see exactly what was in the photographs that I had been analyzing for the past year. And I'm asking Ed, what, what is that? And, and he's looking out the window and he's excited as I am because this is the first time anyone else has been with him when he actually saw, much less photographed one of these objects. So he's asking me what I'm seeing and we're describing to each other exactly what we're seeing and this thing is just pacing along with us for about a minute and a half as we uh, cross the, the bridge here and approach this hump. Uh, and then it just kind of glided over towards the shoreline uh, away from us and, and out of sight. Urschler had studied dozens of pictures of Gulf Breeze sightings. Seeing one for himself dispelled any remaining doubts about their authenticity. It was no longer an issue of, was it real? It was indeed real. It was a real solid object uh, that uh, could perform physical characteristics of aerodynamics that was absolutely foreign to uh, aerospace technology as I knew it. Ed Walters took some spectacular pictures of what he saw above his home. To many people, they were convincing proof that flying saucers are real. Some months later, Ed took this video footage from his back garden. It appears to show three similar objects maneuvering behind the trees. Some of his neighbors also captured extraordinary images. These were taken by Anne and Bruce Morrison. Pictures like these were reinforced by physical evidence of inexplicable goings on. One particular instance still stands out. December 17th of 1987 uh, marked a, a threshold in the evolution of the investigation here of the UFO phenomenon in Gulf Breeze. Uh, on that night, Ed Walters, from his house just down here, uh, got the familiar buzzing he'd been accustomed to hearing with the, the craft showing up, and he looked out and saw this craft right out here above the field, just a, a few feet above the ground. And what was remarkable about that in the photograph that followed was in the days and weeks of the investigation that followed, we had a, a physical phenomenon. The craft had affected the, the grass here and the soil in such a way that first uh, all of the grass had turned white and the ground itself had uh, undergone uh, some sort of energy exposure. For two years, you could clearly see the mark where this craft had been hovering. Uh, the local grounds crew here at the school had come out and put fertilizer down and seeded it and watered it and couldn't get anything to grow. And as you can see, they even recently brought in uh, a brown type of topsoil, which is different than the white surrounding sand here. And you can see they've still not been successful in getting something to grow here in the field. Across the world in Moscow, a group of scientists have observed similar phenomena. Professor Semyakov is a biologist. Ну обычно мы стараемся, чтобы были свидетели. Значит, лучше, если бывает несколько свидетелей, которые фиксируют это место. А затем мы проводим параллельные исследования, то есть делаем биолокацию и либо радиометрическим методом определяем место посадки НЛО. He studied dozens of sites where UFOs are said to have landed. One he's looked at in detail is just outside Moscow. Там характерно было то, что э, было вдавлено почва, э, как бы огромный каток был поставлен на почву диаметром 4 метра. Почва была вдавлена на 5 сантиметров. 
это пока говорит о очень большом весе НЛО. И НЛО представляло собой, как по седам, по рассказам очевидцам, колбу. Эта колба была как бы на ножке, стояла на поляне и возвышалась даже над лесом на 5 метров. He has also conducted experiments using insects. И что для этого пришлось сделать небольшой аппарат. Он заключался в том, что в камер... мы взяли камеру. В этой камере была мембрана, и, и в эту камеру э, сажа... помещались мухи. Но мухи какие? Дрозофилы, бескрылые линии. Мухи могли только бегать по, э, по, этой, по, этой, по, этому, э, значит, по этой мембране, но не могли летать. Далее шел усилитель, и все это прослушивалось с наушниками. Получалось так. Достаточно было. Вот, в частности, эти исследования проведены также в Шарапе охоте. Было достаточно войти на место, в зону посадки НЛО, как мухи возбуждались. Достаточно было выйти из зоны посадки. Мухи опять затихали. Обычно в темноте, в камере, в которой они находятся, они ведут себя тихо и не двигаются. Таким образом, мы можем создать и биоиндикатор, который работает на основе использования насекомых, которые очень чувствительны к различным полям и изменениям полей. Many UFO sightings take place near military installations. One of the best documented was at a US Air Force base in Suffolk, England in 1980. Guards reported seeing a strange object in the forest. A patrol was sent out. The following extracts are taken from a recording made at the time. The patrol was led by Deputy Base Commander Colonel Charles Holt, who sent an official memo about the incident to the Ministry of Defense. He received no response and no explanation for what they saw. In March 1990, there was perhaps one of the strangest close encounters of all, over Belgium. This time, the Belgian Air Force were able to scramble two F-16 fighters to intercept the unidentified intruder. Closing on their target, the pilots locked their radar onto the object. Then something astonishing happened. Within a split second, it accelerated from 280 kilometers per hour to over 1,800 and dropped more than 1,000 meters in altitude. The force created by such a maneuver would be four times greater than the human body can withstand. Unable to match the speed of the UFO, the two F-16s returned to base. But since the 1940s, over 3,500 pilots have reported seeing UFOs. Now retired, former British Airways captain Graham Shepard can finally talk openly about his UFO experiences. On the 22nd of March, 1967, we were returning from Gibraltar to London. Quite suddenly, we were aware that ahead of us was a star which was at least twice as bright as the best of Sirius or Venus, 
all the while it was changing colour. It was it was very very bright, iridescent colours. There were greens and blues, beautiful reds. Um, and suddenly, again, suddenly everything happens. It it started aerobatting. It was moving around the sky, doing figures of eight. It was doing loops. At it was manoeuvring at a rate which is impossible, in my view, for um, known aerodynamic laws. And we asked Bordeaux Radar if they had any unidentified traffic, and they did confirm that they had unidentified traffic 10 miles to the west of us. Pilots, better than anybody else, know there is often a rational explanation for a phenomenon they see in the skies. You see a number of things from the flight deck. Other aeroplanes, we see reflections from the ground. Uh, this is day and night time. Um, cloud formations, the effects of sunlight on cloud ice crystals, um, at higher levels, it's quite common to see satellites. The visibility is, is excellent. It's a very wide angle of view laterally and vertically. We run a very objective, continuous check, if you like, of things that appear outside the aeroplane. And in doing so for thousands and thousands of hours, one builds up quite a bank of experience. Graham's second sighting was even more dramatic. We were on a routine daylight flight back from Scotland to London Heathrow in a, in a Vanguard, cruising at about 24,000 feet. We just transferred from the Scottish controller to the Preston radar controller, made our normal routine radio calls, and within minutes, the Preston radar controller alerted us. He told us we have opposite direction traffic in the airway, very fast moving, unknown. Immediately, of course, we looked out of the flight deck straight ahead of us to the 12 o'clock position and into view came a disc-shaped craft. It was shaped like a discus, shining in the sun. A more accurate description would be like a hubcap, an American car. A cupola on the top, diameter about 30 feet, in my view. I was looking down on the craft, the machine, as it came past, flying at very, very high speed. It came to within about a quarter of a mile of us. I was looking down on it, some two to three hundred feet below us. There are two very curious things. First of all, there was no shock wave from this machine. It was close enough, in my experience, it was close enough to give us quite a bump, a noise and a bang as the shock wave passed us. Secondly, we made no attempt to report an air mist, a near collision, or file an air safety report. So that not only us as a crew, but the Preston radar controller were aware that its strangeness didn't qualify, didn't qualify it for an AMS or a safety report. 25 years on, I feel I've got a long and happy career behind me. And I feel so strongly that the whole subject is and should be in the public domain. So I broke ranks, if you like, I broke ranks and decided to talk about it openly to the media. British Airways were apoplectic, is the only word I can use. They gave me lengthy interviews and they followed up the interviews with a letter which, in all fairness, does describe the conflict that does exist between a subject, the UFOs, which is on the, the fringe of believability, and the credibility of British Airways captains. British Airways uh, want the least possible controversy. They don't want wacky captains. They don't want wacky crews. They don't want 
any of the air crew involved with any subjects which have the slightest um, possibility of uh, compromise. Since modern UFO sightings began, believers have accused politicians and the military of a cover-up. How much do you think governments have suppressed what they have seen or what uh, organs like the Air Forces have seen? Um, it is something that I can't quite frankly prove. You think that the authorities really are, are suppressing the information? Not suppress oh, yes, suppressing, that's true, and, and, and not allowing their junior officials to know anything so they can't tell lies anyway. Mankind is only a fledgling traveller in space, but in just 30 years we've already landed men on the moon and sent probes to other planets. Are we really the only people out there? A number of astronauts in both the former Soviet Union and the United States are rumoured to have encountered UFOs. Armstrong is reported to have seen a UFO or two UFOs on the moon together with Buzz Aldrin and a number of people from NASA have come forward with that story including Maurice Chatelaine who was a communications specialist who helped design the Apollo spacecraft. He confirms that both Armstrong and Aldrin did indeed see UFOs on the moon. I'm not a conspiracy freak as such, but the fact of the matter is that there is an officially acknowledged cover-up of the UFO phenomenon, certainly by the United States authorities. This is easily provable because since the 1970s, thousands of documents on UFOs have now been released by the intelligence community. I'm talking not just about the FBI and the CIA, with, with which we're, we're all familiar, but the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the State Department Bureau of Research, the Atomic Energy Commission, Army, Air Force, Naval Intelligence, and several others, all of whom, with the exception of the Air Force, denied any serious involvement in UFOs and denied having any documents. But thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, we know they've been lying. In Washington, D.C., the Federation of American Scientists has been campaigning against what it sees as excessive government secrecy. One of the peculiar things about the secrecy problem is that no one really knows just how many classified documents there are. There is no inventory, there is no catalog or index. What we do know are bits and pieces of the problem, and the bits and pieces are uh, quite sizable themselves. For example, the National Archives reports that it has more than 300 million pages of classified documents from before 1960 alone that are awaiting declassification review. There is a vast quantity of government documentation on the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects of, of one sort or another. Timothy Good has had first-hand experience of official secrecy. The object that I saw in the sky here in southeast London in 1980 first appeared as a bright point of light, just like Venus or a very bright star and at first I thought maybe this was an aircraft reflecting the last rays of the sun, because this was at about seven minutes past four in the afternoon. Um, but then I realized that it wasn't really in the right position for Venus or any other planet. It was much too bright to be a star. Somebody got videotape of it from the Seven Oaks area, and this is, I think, a 35 to 40 minute video. 
and uh, that clearly shows a point of light in the sky. Unfortunately, you know, without a powerful zoom, you don't get any idea of the shape of it. I mean, that could not be a weather balloon. That's impossible. Because well, it, it wouldn't keep, move up and down like that. It wouldn't keep uh, sort of going up and then going over, reappearing. And it's sort of going in a sort of circle, wouldn't it? Forty other people reported sighting a similar object. Subsequently, I made a lot of inquiries about this object. And uh, I tried the London Weather Center. They said they'd had no reports of unusual activities. I contacted Civil Aviation Authority at Heathrow. They said that no airliners coming into or leaving Heathrow had reported sighting the object. Ministry of Defense confirmed all that and said that there had been no radar tracks of unknown objects at the time in question. Now, that's quite possible, of course, especially if the UFO was able to uh, disguise itself or to screen itself in some way from radar. But I am surprised that uh, some pilots, at least, didn't report it because um, it would have been seen from a very, very wide area. And I'm sure that, that thousands of people must have seen this thing. I mean, it was alternately hovering and maneuvering in a completely clear sky for an hour and 10 minutes. Some of the clearest and most frequent sightings in modern times have happened in Elmwood, Wisconsin. They had so many close encounters that the town became the inspiration for Steven Spielberg's famous film. When the sun goes down over Elmwood, Wisconsin, the people of this tiny town see them. I could see the little legs on it, like little pods on the bottom. It was a saucer-shaped deal. When it got over the village, and it was gone out of sight. Oh, look, it's brighter, brighter. Oh, yeah. Almost everyone in this community of over 900 people has either seen a UFO or knows a relative who has. People call it the forbidden uh, village in the Forsaken Valley. <laughs> but Elmwood decided to go one step further in making contact. In our opinion, this is going to represent man's grand attempt here to reach out and establish uh, a relationship with this society. They're trying to raise $16 million to build a landing base and entice their alien visitors out of their spacecraft. But there are many people who already claim to have met aliens. I was here in this room, in our bedroom, and it was 3.17 a.m., the early hours of the morning. I was here... Uh, alone. My husband had gone away on a training course. Um, I was sleeping on that side of the bed and my young son was sleeping on this side. He was a lot smaller then. And I'd, I was woken up by... It was just a strange feeling, really. It was like unseen hands sort of shaking me awake. Um, and I had this urge to get out of bed and go and look out the window. It was like someone was telling me to go and look out the window. It, just very strange. Um, I did. I, I got out of the bed and I walked over to those windows and looked out and in the distance there were lots of little lights moving around and I thought at first that they were just stars, you know, moving around in the distance. I remember thinking, you know, wow, they look pretty and then realising that stars don't do that. I felt myself sort of being lifted up, being pulled upwards and I was in this light, lots of blue, blue-white light and then the light dimmed down and I could see sort of shadows moving around in this light. And then the light sort of dimmed down a bit more and then there standing in front of me were what I would describe as three non-human beings. Well, they were about three and a half to four feet tall, brown, tan in colour, and had large oval heads, large oval black eyes, had long skinny arms. Um, they looked like undeveloped children. Um, they moved up and stood in front of me, um, and one of them stood directly ahead and one on either side. And they had a funny smell to them. I think the most traumatic part, really, was this taller one had come and stood by my head. And he wasn't holding me, but I felt like he was holding me down. He was leaning across the head of this table and staring into my face. And I couldn't move. It was like all I could do was respond to him looking at me. And 
one of the the other little brown um, guys came came over from the right and he was holding something that looked like a single strand of fiber optic cable and it was lit up all along its length it didn't have a, a light on it or anything it was just a light and the one standing at the head of the table took my head and sort of turned it slightly facing that way and then I just felt this most tremendous pain um, like my head was being sort of split open on the inside it was just a tremendous pain and I knew that whatever this was that this one was carrying that they'd stuck it into my head and I felt a sharp pull at the back of my head like a tug a sudden tug and I was laying on as I say laying on this table and I can remember I'm crying and the tears are, are, are running down my nose and sort of dropping onto my lip and I can taste them I can taste the salty tears you know and it's not the sort of thing those aren't the things that happen in dreams those are the things that happen for real I have experienced vivid dreams like, you know, everyone else, and they remain with you for a while. In fact, they're extremely vivid. But I have never, ever woken up from such a dream or a nightmare with hair missing from the back of my head, um, a, a small hole in my navel that was leaking fluid, um, all the bruises where this, you know, pencil thing had touched me, and this overwhelming sort of memory of smells and sounds you know, these are, these are real, as I say, sort of sense, this is real sensory input here, and you just don't get that in dreams. You know, this was real. Whatever level of reality it was, it was definitely real. The nearest star to our planet is 40,000 light years away. Even if we had the technology to get there, none of us would survive the journey. In the 1960s, NASA established the search for extraterrestrial intelligence using huge dishes to scan the airwaves. But despite a few close calls, they're still waiting to hear that vital message from the stars. This object was seen in Ottawa, Canada in 1991 and recorded by an unknown cameraman. The object still remains a mystery. As the camera moves closer, we see what looks like the outline of a flying saucer. I believe UFOs have been going on, if they are natural energies, they've been going on as long as the Earth's been going on. I think it's part of the natural environment of the Earth. They got a name for themselves in 1947 when Kenneth Arnold saw some in Washington State, USA, and he just used this phrase that they were moving like a saucer would if you skipped it across water, and the newspaper reporter then picked that up and used the term flying saucer. I've described that term, flying saucer, as the best advertising slogan in the world because people are still buying the product 40 years later even though they don't know what they're buying. I'm convinced that there is a very fine line between fear of ridicule and official secrecy. And I'm sure that one of the reasons the authorities are loath to get involved in any public discussion of the phenomena is because they're afraid of looking stupid. In 1977, NASA launched the Voyager space probes on a mission to travel into infinity, deep space. On board, they carry a message from the human race. In years to come, they too could become mysterious UFOs circling above some far distant planet. How will its inhabitants react to the idea that aliens have been exploring their world, investigating them? <laughs>